Okay. Good day, everyone. I'm Zanda Hilger, and I coordinate the North Central Texas Caregiver Teleconnection on behalf of North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging and the Dallas Area Agency on Aging. We partner with WellMed Foundation to provide these in a partnership with them. And uh, we have our, the support of Minerva Villarreal, who is there to help us in San Antonio. And I've been doing these for like five years and, and Minerva and I have never even met. We just need to figure out a way to, to uh, remedy that. Our topic today is one that many of you may be very, uh, that has come up in conversations you've had in your own families as you are a caregiver and as you work with family members and perhaps reach out to them for help. But this idea of family caregiving across the generations, it is astounding to me how many caregivers, the even the age of caregivers, there seems to be a trend that the family caregivers themselves are younger. And a lot of that has to do with early onset Alzheimer's and dementias, as well as many older adults develop chronic illnesses and there may not be um, the typical spouse or other family member around. So family caregiving, even though it still is primarily a spouse or an adult child who is helping with the caregiving, uh, very much more so now, we find that family caregiver giving has to go through a couple of generations in my own family. I have a son who's um, gotten involved with his in-laws because his father-in-law uh, needed help with Lewy body dementia. And the family is all very supportive, but the key was keeping the communication open. And I'm sure that Catherine will be uh, touching on that. Our speaker today is Catherine McDonald. She believes in taking care of caregivers. It's one of her, her priorities in her life now. Her background is in geriatrics and in supporting vulnerable people, be that patients, the homeless, and those in prisons. Want to hear a little bit more about that, Catherine. Through education and psychology, she brings an understanding of social and emotional well-being that, thank you, Catherine, for joining us, and I'm going to switch over and get our slides so that you can see them. I'm kind of uh, doing multi-duty today, everybody, which is fine, but if you would be patient with me. Here we go. Can everybody see that okay? Can you see the slides? Okay, excellent. I'm going to hand it over to you, Catherine. Okay, well, thank you, Zanda, and thank you, Minerva, for inviting me to speak today. Um, hi, everyone. Um, and I, I'm really passionate about the caregiving topic. It's a personal topic. It's a professional topic. And I want you to recognize that family is not only considered biological. I think we have families of friends. We have families of supportive communities. Um, so just know that that term family is not strictly a biological caregiver. Um, okay, a little bit about me. The next slide. Um, I have a background in psychology and English, and I am a certified dementia care provider. I, as Sandra told you, whom I worked with and that I have been involved with support groups for over 10 years. Um, I've run support groups for all kinds of disease groups and, um, people who are struggling with chronic health conditions. And in the community, I am an advocate for older adults. Um, I understand grief and the lessons of sadness, anticipatory grief. And um, I'm here to build some connections to help prevent loneliness. 
Next slide, please. Okay, come on. And we were doing so well. <laughs> come on. There we go. There we go. Thank you. So um, I, I wanted to talk to you about the realities of caregiving. Um, and by 2030, a fifth of the population will be 65 years plus. So older people will equal the number of children under the age of 18. So there's, there's um, an interesting thing that the U.S. will become the every generation nation. And I think that's going to change certainly the outlook. Um, we're living longer. I have a mother-in-law who's 103 years old. And thanks to medical advancements, she's still alive today. Um, but I've watched her move through, you know, being living independently into living in assisted living um, and to now um, living in a hospital. Um, so she's her dependency has increased as she's aged. And there's something called the sandwich generation. Um, so um, I'm sure it's been around since 1981, coined by a social worker named Dorothy Miller. And um, what is interesting about that is sandwich, you think of a sandwich as two pieces of bread, the caregivers are in the middle. And on either side of the sandwich, we have children, we have um, loved ones, neighbors, and we have on this side, we have older adults. So we are responsible for living our own life. And sometimes we have one or more or multiple others which can be a double blessing or a triple burden um, because it's a lot to try and, and engage. And 76% of caregivers are um, unemployed so that that is their primary focus. So, um, and you know, they're also caregivers, 61% are women. And Sam, this may reflect what you were talking about earlier. The average age is 40 of caregivers. So um, informed givers of people with dementia, that's what PWD is. And I chose this um, area to focus on because of the um, tremendous burden that dementia is causing for us um, in this in this culture. My mother had dementia um, for eight, not eight and a half years. Um, she died last year. And it was a journey that was really intense um, for my family and um, for my children and for even my cousins. Everyone was trying to be um, supportive where they could, but it was often didn't feel like enough. So I wanted to give you this big picture about dementia because there are 128 different kinds of dementia um, and people, with dementia can live up to 20 years. That's a long time for dependency and for caregiving. Um, and the average, oops, sorry, Xander, can you just, thanks, go back, thank you. So the average year is like uh, eight to 10 years. And um, I'm curious if you can put in the chat, how many of you are caring for someone with dementia? Um, and, you know, how that experience is for you, maybe just one word, or even if it's not someone with dementia, just, you know, how, what is, what is the, um, your experience of that? So 
I don't need to read through all of these. You are all capable of reading, but I just wanted you to have the bigger picture about informal means unpaid caregivers. Okay, next one, please, Sandra. So here's really where um, caregiving becomes a burden sometimes. Um, mental health is truly the biggest challenge with caregiving. Um, and it's depression and anxiety that are, that are the key um, components of burnout. So with the National um, Health Alliance of Caregiving, 85% of caregivers said they wanted more information on managing stress. Um, so care, caregiver fatigue is real. It is, um, it's difficult and it happens to families and it's dangerous. So um, I want you to just be aware that isolate, feelings of isolation are normal because you're, you're just really wrapped in trying to care for your loved one. You feel guilt if you do get away with, and take some needed time for yourself, you feel guilty doing it. And then you feel some relief when you're gone. And you're if you're having some fun, you always feel this sense of, oh, I should be with my loved one. And I'm, I don't deserve to have this kind of um, joy or fun in my life. So the emotional challenges are certainly where the weight of the responsibility and the stress lands. That's where the depression, the anxiety lives. And I know a lot of caregivers make a promise that they will keep their loved ones at home. They will keep them, um, you know, and, and they can die at home. Sometimes that promise is not able to happen as you move down the disease process. Um, you just can't manage it. And it is really, it's a, it's a risk. And what is important here is that it's a heavy load and that the death risk of a caregiver is higher if your loved one shadows you. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we all need privacy. We absolutely do. And here is a frightening statistic that 30% of caregivers die before the person they're caring for. Oh. So it's real. It, caregiving burnout and fatigue is real. And I want to give you a couple of real life examples. Um, one is of Leanne, who um, names change to protect the people, who... Um, was in my memory care support group because her husband had Alzheimer's and she cared for him. She eventually had to put him into a facility, a group home. She found the best placement she could. She drove miles to see him every day. She neglected her own health. And after he died, she went in for an overdue mammogram and discovered she had advanced breast cancer. Um, a second story is Mary, who died with a heart attack while caring for her husband who had dementia. And she died on the kitchen floor and her heart just stopped. And her husband thought she was sleeping. Um, because he cognitively could not process that she was she was not breathing anymore. So if she had, the um, medical practitioners determined that if she had had some help earlier on and paid her attention to her body um, and had some treatment, she would not have had that severe heart attack. 
So I give you those two real life examples because they're frightening and they are real. So, um, and one other thing to just keep in your back pocket is that caregiving can shorten your life by eight years. So, you know, caring for yourself cannot wait. Um, I, I want you to think about how you experience burnout and what is, what is the, your biggest challenge with being a caregiver. And so knowing it, recognizing it in yourself and thinking about how you can avoid it um, because it is your health that is important. And, you know, we have to guard our health. We have to be somewhat selfish in taking care of ourselves. So let's talk about how we can, how we can improve our situations and our lives. Um, next slide, please, Sandy. Come on. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. So we want to um, think about wellness. We want to think about change and how we have to be in the driver's seat for this. People don't they might say, hey, can I help you? Typically in our culture, we're like, no, no, I got this. I'm fine. I don't need help. Um, but you do. You do need help, you, even if it's just time to get away and take a walk, um, to, to be by yourself, to, to catch your breath. Um, we need to ask for help. And so I encourage you to make a list of who can help you. Family members, you know, maybe distant family members, if your immediate family or the immediate family is not so really much help, that happens. Neighbors, who is in your neighborhood who, who can help? Um, I have a neighbor who has, his wife has dementia, and he, I've, I've reached out to him a number of times and said, I'm here, I, I've um, offered to sit with her, I brought him food um, because she was the cook and he doesn't cook. So however you can um, ask for help and give help, you know that you would want to help someone in the situation if they needed it. So make a list of, of where you can find help, churches, schools, um, where, wherever you can, make an exhaustive list. Maybe there's day programs in your, in your community that you can use. Think about who else and then how else. So who can help you and how can you find support and help? Maybe auto paying bills, autofill prescriptions, long distance um, support, calls, FaceTime, all of those things are important so you don't feel alone and you don't sink into the mire of depression and loneliness. Um, so you want to think about um, working. If, and many, many people are juggling, trying to juggle their work lives and their caregiving. So there are some solutions. You can ask for um, help with your boss, explain to your boss what's happening and maybe see if you can do some remote work. Um, search for a job that has more flexibility, maybe that you can arrive late and or leave early. Um, take some leaves of the absence at work when you need to. Maybe work part-time instead of full-time. I know it's financially a decision that many of us struggle to make, but we really cannot do it all um, as caregivers. And, um, you know, if, if you can think about how to get help, asking for help, finding for help, 
that's important. And the second one is guard your well. So think about the old air airplane mask that you put it on yourself before you put it on a child or someone else, or the empty cup. You can't drink from an empty cup. Um, so think about what brings you joy and make a date with yourself to go and find something that will um, refill your cup. Um, you know, make a date with a friend, even a phone date. Um, remember what your dreams are or were or create new ones. Um, you certainly can, can do that. And I think there are small things like take your time, slow down with things, um, breathe deeply, breathe deeply when you're waiting for uh, the microwave <laughs> to finish, um, you know, or you're loading laundry. Think about how you can include the importance of breath support to help you relax. Pay attention to your senses. You know, one of the key things for helping to release anxiety is looking around, smelling what whatever you can smell, hear, see, touch, taste. Use your senses. Um, and, you know, it's it, all of those things are are relatively easy to incorporate. So resources, certainly like this one with the caregiver connection, um, it is rich with support and it gives you a necessary respite. And um, you should you should try and tune in as often as possible, or at least make time in your schedule to go back and watch the recordings because I know Xander does a tremendous job in finding really great speakers and, and the program's rich. Um, and there's also the National Institute of Health, the National Institute of Aging, the Gerontological Society, if you're dealing with someone older. Certainly um, there are disease specific groups. So if your person, your loved one has Alzheimer's, the Alzheimer's Association, Lewy Body um, Foundation, there are disease specific um, groups that can provide a lot of help. So I've included, and we can go to the next one, Sandra, please. I included something that is a delight. Um, this is a movie that is is not recent. It was um, created, I'm not even sure when, at least three or four years ago, before, before the pandemic. And it's really a tender, poignant film about multi-generational character. Um, and Jane Seymour is just, tremendous in her role as Ruby, who has dementia. So, um, you know, you can watch that with your whole family and find the sweet side of dementia and care. And um, there's also another movie that's being released that is um, called Thelma. It's new, it, it isn't out yet, but it is fun. And it's about an older, woman who's a new actress and she um she gets into some trouble because she's being scammed with fraud by a fraud um fraud scam money scam and so she she attempts to try and get her money back so it's just it's really um a delight to watch and those kind of things do give you they give you joy. Um, they can help release the anxiety and watch them with a friend. You know, that reduces your cortisol, which is the anxiety hormone. 
um, just by connecting with another person, a friend. Um, so those are some novel resources that I wasn't sure if, if you'd seen them. If you would like to put some other ones in the chat that you found that are um, useful and um, helpful to you, please, please add them. I'm sure everybody would appreciate them. And um, last, I've got a quote that is next, and then I have a poem that I wanted to read to you. Okay. So, and yeah. I did add, I did add Thelma. Oh, excellent. And Thanks. it's, um, it's the, the information I just saw suggests it'll be in theaters only, at least right oh, now. Okay, it's, yes, it's quite new, but it's certainly fun to watch. So um, here's some of the resources. That... I take that. I'm sorry. Okay, if I if could interrupt real quick. Sure. Actually, I'm wrong. <laughs> it's also going to be available on Netflix, Apple Plus, TV Plus, Prime. So it's going to be, people will be able to stream it from their home. They listed the theaters first and I didn't scroll down far enough. That's okay. No worries. So these are just some maybe novel um, resources that maybe you haven't tapped into. So I wanted to find things that might be fresh. Um, and the Sandwiched Caregiver is a blog. It's an interesting blog that you can um, read. Um, and then the more Nate Village to Village is really talks about community and how it takes a village. And that's that's a lovely connection. The neighbor force is also worth a visit. And then there's one called Working Daughter. And then I just included the Alzheimer's Association there. So um, those resources might be worthwhile for you to just check out. They're kind of fresh and fun. Um, okay, so uh, can, can I go to the last um, slide there, please, Sonia? So this is Charles Darwin, and, you know, we think about him as being, um, you know, the strongest of the species. And I like this quote because it takes it further. It's just not about strength nor is it intelligence to survive, but the person who is most responsive to change. And I think that, that it's our outlook, it's how we look at the world. And caregiving, we tend to get stuck. We tend to feel there's so much changing around us and with the person we're caring for that we can't focus on ourselves. But if we take a bit of time to respond to change, um, to what's happening and change ourselves and our energy, it can make a big difference. So this last, um, before we go to the chat and any questions, um, there's a woman named Donna Ashworth. She's a delightful poet. And um, I love her words because they resonate um, on just a very important level about life. So this one says, joy does not arrive with a fanfare on a red carpet strewn with the flowers of a perfect life. Joy sneaks in as you pour a cup of coffee, watching the sun hit your favorite tree just right. And you usher joy away because you were not ready for it. Your house is not as it might must be for such a distinguished guest. But joy cares nothing for your messy home or your bones, or your waistline, you see. Joy is supposed to slither through the crack 
our imperfect life. And that's how life works. You cannot invite joy in. You can only be ready when she appears. And hug her with meaning because in this very moment, joy chose you. So I hope that you will choose joy every day. Find some little thing like watching the sun hit your favorite tree. Um, and just be um, aware that looking for joy, taking the time to find joy, even if it's in the color of your toothpaste or your loved one's eyes, find something to slow down and focus on and anticipate joy because it's there for us. It's there for us to embrace every day. So, Sandra, any questions or comments or anything we should to about that in the day? Catherine, I think the big question um, that I have heard discussed that like to hear from you and from some of the listeners. The big question to me is how do you involve the younger generations in a family in caregiving? Because frequently the responses are, I'm too busy, I've got school, I've got work, whatever. How do you engage younger generations of a family in helping in some way with the caregiving? Well, I'll go back to ask for help. I think it's easy to say, I'm too busy, I have school, I have work, I have young children myself. Um, but I think what, what works and what I, we've done in my family, if we scheduled times for family to be engaged and to say, I, you know, I understand that your life is very busy, but I need help. Okay. You know, your grandmother needs help. Your grandfather needs help. Your brother needs help. Your, you know, I need help because I, I'm tired and this caregiving is hard on me. And you can use the, the data about caregivers, you know, dying before the person with the disease, you know, it, it's shocking. But sometimes um, we need to tell the truth about caregiving. And so not just asking for help, but being more insistent that you are you need it because you're buckling under the pressure and you are not able to manage it all by yourself. And I think scheduling, getting people to give them specific things, you know, um, I, I'd like you to make a meal on Tuesday evening. I would like you to do my, get my groceries, come and do my laundry. Um, and, you know, they might not do your laundry to the way your own levels of expectation, but it will be done and be very grateful when it when it's done. Um, you know, it is, and, and you're, you know, by encouraging strongly family engagement, um, it's good modeling. It's good modeling for younger people to be generous. And I think that Ruby's choice you'll see is, um, it's very good about that to engage younger younger people in caregiving. He has the young man has a lovely relationship with his grandmother, and there's the blessing there is um, palpable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
And Catherine, a quick follow-up question. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that it helps if perhaps we give family choices? A or B, I need help with the groceries, but I also need help for somebody to pick up the meds or whatever. Sure. Yeah. It, does that make any difference? I think it does because it gives people personal power. You know, we all like choices. We want to be um, self-directed individuals. So when I said ask for help, make your list of all the things you need help with. And it can be as small as, you know, cleaning the toilets. I don't know. Nobody would sign up for that. <laughs> um, but the things really make the list of the things that you need help with. And um, and give give people a choice, but being very clear about what you need and breaking it down into into simple steps, if you can, it, it makes people more willing to support um, you. Yeah. Okay. JC has written in chats. I have done these requests, but siblings have accused me of being controlling and bossy, even if given choices on how to help, that our mom shouldn't expect us to give up their lives to care for our mom. That's that's a very interesting um, psychological dilemma. And I think that it needs... Um, it, it needs a family discussion that your mom has taken care of you and raised you. And now it's time to give back to her. She deserves to be with the people who love her. And it needs to be an equal responsibility. Otherwise, people start to feel resentful. I've had that experience in my own family and also have been um, labeled as a seagull, you know, that I can just fly in and create a ruckus and then fly away. Um, but that that isn't, I, I think that's an unfair assumption. But having a family meeting and saying, who will be responsible for which part of the care? Because there's so many pieces in the care. And um, find out what the family is willing to give and do, um, family members. Maybe it's only phone calls or FaceTimes, but commit them to it. Commit them to that once a week, once every two days. You know, it's it needs to be important that um, they make a commitment, and everyone hears them make a commitment, and we're you're all in it together. The second part of that question she had was, "They're seeing me as being bossy." Mm -hmm. What are some ideas that you or anyone listening today might have about how do you? Um, how does one reduce that perception? What do I, as that primary caregiver, need to do differently so that I get more cooperation and less pushback because my siblings or other family members think I'm just controlling and bossy? Mm -hmm. um, is there anybody in the chat who wants to respond to that or... I don't know if you can unmute it's, them. It's very common. Yes. It's a um, very common. Um, put it in chat or raise um, those of you that know um, much about Zoom. <laughs> let me find it. You can actually um, ask to be taken off mute. If I can get to it. Yeah. If you type, if you would just type whoever is, um, might have a comment about that. I, I, um, I'm curious because 
I, in my own family situation, I'm the oldest and I've often been the one who was assigned to take charge by my parents. Um, and so it was a natural kind of evolution to the care. Um, I think, and I, I think that my siblings didn't always appreciate that I was, you know, I was um, taking charge, but we needed to do a lot of talking. And I, you know, I think it's personalities that are very um, telling <laughs> about who takes on which roles and how how one person is more engaged than another might be. And then when you have families where there aren't really very many people to share the weight, um, then it you if you're looking for help outside of the the biological structure, then it's it's okay if you're more bossy because it is your your loved one. But certainly family dynamics have a huge role. And I encourage you, all of you, to um, work those through because when your loved one dies, it's so much better if you've been there and you've worked out those things during the time that, that they're alive, the care, because the the regrets and the resentments mm -hmm. will last if you don't work it out when they're alive mm -hmm. and it can break the family to, to yeah. pieces so they're not easy conversations but they're really important one of the participants has made the comment um here we go, that they were the baby of the family and it was assumed that they would have to take that responsibility um, on. Yeah. And that every family is different. It's a good Absolutely. comment. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it needs conversation. Mm -hmm. It needs a conversation. And, you know, if you have been the one to set the stage with the director of the care, then direct a conversation and mm -hmm. say, we all need, and I don't know if any of you know about the conversation project. That's a lovely end of life discussion we all should be having um, because it it's about care before, mm -hmm. um, before, your your loved one is no longer here and um that might be an opportunity to have people come together right. and then also talk about the caregiving aspect mm -hmm. so and i would direct everyone to youtube we did that topic uh two months ago and mm -hmm. Lori miller here locally in the dallas area uh, was the speaker and she's been been very involved in that yes um, and the name of that topic is essential conversations and it is a youtube recording mm -hmm. i had another i have another comment yes um she writes i have learned to voice my discomfort when it comes to taking care of my mother there have been some changes and some siblings have been more helpful it is just a matter of talking to your siblings and really listening to what each person has to say. Yes, absolutely. That's um, because I don't think as siblings, we are used to being on the, the level of being the caregiver of our parents. We've been used to being taken care of. It's a big shift mm -hmm. or or our husbands sometimes, or our wives, or the relationship shifts. It does not 
stay the same, which is one of the reasons I put about being most responsive to change. Okay. You know, if if you're someone who is has been an introvert and not very assertive in your life, and yet you are tasked with being the caregiver, it's hard to ask for help, but we need to change. And you know, Sandra, that's lovely. Resilience and responsive to change, absolutely. That's that's where our strength can come from. We have we find our own joy, and that helps us with those difficult conversations. Right. And I think just remembering to ask for help. You know, I cannot do all this by myself, and our, your loved one deserves to be the best care he, he or she um, can have. And that's a good starting place. Unless, of course, some people don't agree that your loved one deserves the best care because maybe they weren't a great parent or maybe they were a nasty sibling or a, you know, not very kind child. Um, but it's still, it's still a human being who deserves dignity, honor, and care. And if we can't, if we can't do that, I, I know in my situation, I hired some um, women, and we've done it with my mother-in-law as well, to come in to be their companions, mm -hmm. because my family weren't always reliable for a number of reasons. And so I just said, okay, I can't always be there, but I'm going to make sure that Vanessa was there to be me when I couldn't be there. It was worth every penny mm -hmm. that I spent to pay her when I couldn't be there myself. So one of the other participants who we've heard from before said, um, in referring to how personalities uh, are different. Exact same situation for myself, different personalities. Same as growing up, but having to take care of mom has brought those individual differences into conflict. Thank you for the insight. You're welcome. And I, you know, I think it would be good to um, have a family therapy session with you know, a psychologist who deals with family dynamics. Um, if you can, I, that would never work in my family. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't fly with the, the personalities that um, I have in my own family. But if you could, if you could get that engagement, um, mm -hmm. that would be amazing to have an objective person out, over there. Yeah. And I'd like to offer another resource also. Um, they may not be able to meet all of your needs, but if you contact the Area Agency on Aging that serves your community, they're throughout the United States, in our, uh, and also you can reach them by calling 211. That is like, uh, it is a resource center, and you'll frequently hear the term ADRC or Aging and Disability Resource Centers. If you call 211 and you request that you need assistance with whatever it is, whether it's something like what, what we're talking about, they might have resources um, or, or names that they could refer you to. And they also do a lot of different things, such as um, help with uh, applying for Medicare. Answering a lot of questions is frequently what they do. So that is... Um, another resource for people to use of so just start asking some questions in the community and see what help that you can get. Yeah. Other questions that you have, it's 1255 or 55 minutes after the hour. So please, if you have a comment or a question, and then I have a, a brief question for our speaker before we end.
And while you're just, giving thought to that, you will see that the session survey has popped up on your screen. And that's what I referred to earlier. Uh, it's a series of it. There's eight short questions and it's primarily uh, yes or no or satisfied or neutral. It's um, easy choices to make and it does give us some valuable information. Um, so again, Go one ahead. thing one thing that I did not include because I am going to I'm part of an interest group tomorrow on paid caregiver support. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I may need to tune back in with you, Zanda, about mm -hmm. anyone who's interested in knowing about financial support for right. caregivers because oh, there okay. are there are certainly um, some resources out there, but it's not clear how to get them and it's complicated. It's very complicated and it primarily comes down to how much money that the family has available. This is the rainy day frequently mm -hmm. that a family now has to face. And so many people, they don't have the resources to pay anywhere from um, uh, $20 plus an hour for a paid caregiver, but there are some other options. And sometimes the Area Agency on Aging, ADRC, um, agencies such as Alzheimer's Association, the Senior Source in Dallas, There's there are some resources, but they may be limited because the demand is going up and the resources mm -hmm. might not be. So again, that's a 211 call. Um, Catherine, if you were to summarize in maybe the top two or three suggestions, the walk away mm -hmm. for, for us today, what might those be? Well, I think ask for help. Be specific about what you need um, help with it's, and make your list and reach out to your community, to your um, churches, your schools, your friends, family, be very clear about how they can help you ask for help. The second thing I would think is because of caregiver fatigue, take care of yourself. Know when you're getting burnt out. Know the very critical statistics about your own well-being. And make sure that you take some time to take care of you. Um, anticipate where you can have breaks, where you can find um, some way to find joy. And just know that caregiving is a demanding, hard role, unappreciated in our society, um, taxing, and that there is a lot of support, but you have to be the one to seek it. It won't come to you. And creating the mind frame of change to be able to have um, to have that come to seek it and to have it, it be meaningful in your own life. The connections must be meaningful with what you need. So mm -hmm. I would encourage you to take, take care of yourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, Catherine, thank you so much for your time and the thoughts you've given and our listeners, the thoughtful questions that you have. Hopefully you've walked away with some new insights or maybe some additional plans that you can make to engage your family more. And think about those younger generation. Very often I've seen research that if younger people didn't spend much time around their grandparents, they tend to have a, a real challenge in interacting with any older person. Mm -hmm. So however we can engage them, um, and focus on what skill set they have that might 
meet a real need that the primary caregiver has identified. So sometimes it means getting creative and mm -hmm. sometimes it won't work. And that's another reality, right, Catherine? Sometimes it doesn't matter what you do, it's not working. Absolutely. You have, fall, you have to fall back and start over, hit the reset button like a computer. Absolutely. Yep, that's true. Try another strategy. Just try change. another way. Change, Again, thank change you, Catherine. it up. You're thank welcome. You everyone who joined us today and uh, take care and listen in. Keep listening because Teleconnection has some really helpful, valuable tools and speakers to provide you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Zanda. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye.